So what do you think? It's really nice. I love the colors, lots of cool features. Love the check mark, of course. So would you say you're satisfied, mostly satisfied, or completely satisfied? Uh, completely? Great, great. Now, on a scale from uh, one to 10, how would you rate your camper shopping experience? Uh, I, I didn't know you cared so much about shopping for recreational vehicles. <laughs> no, no, I actually don't. I'm just making sure all of us are ready for the new VZ Pulse Plus survey coming out soon. Oh, VZ Pulse Plus, yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to Up to Speed. You heard Jess and Andy getting excited about it. Coming up July 27th, it's the next employee survey and we're calling it VZ Pulse Plus. It's powered by Gallup, a leader in analytics, to dig deeper into how we can serve you, our V-teamers, and keep our sights on the future. The VZ Pulse Plus is a supercharged survey. Not only is it an expanded version of our current employee survey, but we'll also work with Gallup to evaluate our results compared to other industry leaders. Through a data-first approach, we can continue to win for our customers and each other. More to come on VZ Pulse Plus, but it goes without saying that we want to reach 100% participation to make sure every V-team voice is heard. This is how we build our future together. And what's Andy doing with that camper? Well, you may remember he wanted to hit the road this summer, but hit a roadblock. So he's got a new plan. Stay tuned to Monday's Up to Speed to find out what that is. Today, we're talking about some of the conversations that are continuing to happen around the business and how they're inspiring action. Earlier this week, Robert Fisher, who leads federal government relations, sat down with Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks and Mr. Shark Tank. The longtime friends discussed Shark Tank, basketball, golf, 5G and technology leadership, as well as social and racial justice. I think one of the things that really came through in this conversation was Mark's straightforward approach and candor in speaking on things like white privilege. I think I went through the same process a lot of white people go through, you know, and when we hear the term racist, when we hear the, the term white privilege, we immediately get defensive mm -hmm. and we immediately start to manufacture equivalency to try to show that we can't possibly be part of the problem. We can't possibly be racist. We talk about our black friends. We talk about growing up in this community or that community. We talk about what we did for, for this minority community, you know. So because of all these things we do, all this manufactured equivalency, we can't possibly be racist. And then we stop, you know, because we kind of just stepped away from being part of the problem. So it can't part, ever deal with us. When in reality, when you looked at oppressed minorities, communities, you know, black people in particular, they're not causing the problem. They're not choosing to be oppressed. They're, this systemic racism that exists, and it does exist, they're not saying, please, you know, can I have more? You know, they're fighting to get rid of it, but the reality is it's white people that have to be the solution because right. we're the problem. You can check out the full conversation with Robert and Mark on Inside Verizon or the Inside Verizon app. Next 20 is our new series of conversations about the top issues that will define the next 20 years. Each episode will feature emerging and established change makers to explore the inspiration behind their activism and their ideas to build a more equitable future. From this series, we hope to accelerate their calls for change and move the world forward for good. Our second episode will be released on Tuesday, July 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern. It explores voter education and how advocates are working on the front lines to ensure that every vote counts. Diana had a conversation with Latasha Brown, co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Kyle Learman, CEO of When We All Vote, Chloe Mason, Senior Teen President, Greater Essex County, Jack and Jill of America, Inc., and Dylan Wilkes, Senior Teen Legislative Chair, Greater Essex County, Jack and Jill of America, Inc. We've got a quick preview for you today. Take a look. All right, you know, 2020 has been this seismic year for change. I mean, we knew that 2020 was going to be a big year for voting. And then, you know, COVID-19 hit, which upended everything. And then all of this change began to happen and, and these protests and this movement when we saw the videos of what happened at Ahmaud Arbery and Graham Taylor and George Floyd. And now going into these elections, we're faced with a very motivated electorate. So I'm going to start with you, Latasha. Tell me how the, the confluence of all of these things coming together you know, weeks before these elections are beginning, during the primaries, how is this affecting your activism? Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. 
I am a native of Selma, Alabama, and this is my life is like a confluence of all of this. This is the 55th anniversary of the voting rights movement in this country. Um, in August, that would be the 55th year of the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Yet we're still dealing with issues around voter suppression and making sure that people have free and fair access to the ballot. And so what we see right now is this really unique opportunity to really not bury our heads in the sand, but to actually move this country forward. Can't wait to hear the rest of that conversation and what the other guests have to say, or maybe sing. We kicked off Next 20 last week with a conversation around criminal justice reform with three guests, Adrian Burrell, Xavier McElrath Bay, and Christina Swarns, who shared their personal stories and thoughts on what actions we can take to bring about change. Today, as a follow-up to that conversation, we're providing a V-Team perspective. Jeremy sat down with Mike Mason, head of corporate security, and Kathy Grillo and Donna Epps, two leaders on our public policy team, to get their reaction to that Next 20 segment and talk about what can be done. We'll leave you today with that conversation. And there's something that just is taken away from you in that moment that you can't get back. It makes you a part of a family nobody wanted to be a part of. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of families, impacted families in Vallejo whose loved ones weren't as lucky to mm -hmm. to survive. And I, and I did. And so as I like, I, I came across these mothers at these at these protests and they would just, I didn't know even know who they were. And they would just run up on me. They would just grab me and say, baby, I saw your video. I'm so happy you alive. I'm so happy you here. I love you. Take down my phone number. Call me if you need anything. Like, um, it just, it, it, it does something. And I think that I couldn't, you know, once you're a part of a family, you, you know, you ride for that family. And so that's pretty much just what I've been doing, you know, going to the protests, documenting as much as I can. Um, uh, I made a, a short film called Favor and Grace that's in post-production right now that kind of brings it a little bit of attention and shines a light on what's going on in Vallejo. And just trying to continually find different ways to be a catalyst for and help get those voices out there. It hurts not to be free. You know, it hurts not to be with my family. It hurts to see my family still struggling. It hurts to wake up every day and, and seeing myself change as a person, knowing in my heart that I'm a caring, compassionate person, that I'm not a monster like they said I was. I, I just felt like there was something deeply existentially wrong with what I was going through. And I couldn't quite put a put a put words to it, but I knew that this was just not the reality that I should be living because I was never truly a monster. And I just felt as much as I changed, if only the world had conformed to that, if only the world had seen me for who I was and responded to that, you know, in so many words, if only there was another chance. And fortunately for me, I had a light at the end of the tunnel. I knew that I would be able to get out in a matter of years. But for me, I find the people I represent and their families and the resilience and the extraordinariness of uh, what they have endured inspiring. And it makes me, you know, it, to, so it shuts up whatever in my head, whatever concerns or, con, you know, complaints I may have about it's late and it's work, right? Because people have endured so much more than I have um, and the resilience and the the humor, right? The grace, like, you know, the people I represent are unfailingly, um, really remarkable people and interesting and fascinating. You know, they're just whole human beings. Hey, what's up, everybody? We are continuing our conversation of our next 20 series. The series is meant to uh, bring in some thought leaders to talk about where we're going as Verizon, but also put some action around it. Today, uh, three uh, important guests with us uh, today. I've got Donna Epps and Kathy Grillo, both from the uh, public policy teams, as well as Mike Mason, who is our chief security officer. I'm going to be getting some of their reactions to our first next 20 episode and talking uh, to them and getting their uh, their thoughts on where we can take it from here. So I want to start out with everybody and uh, just get your general reaction to, to what you saw in this. Mike, I want to start with you. Heard the words broken uh, in that first episode. How do you fix something that's so broken and where does it start? Well, I think you have to start with, with very tangible measures. First of all, everybody has to believe that they can be involved in some way. So let's say that that's about voting, about attending town hall meetings, about understanding who your representatives are and where they stand. And it's also about when you have even a minor complaint uh, taking it to the police department. Now, on the police department side, the judicial side, maybe we need to consider more uh, citizen 
citizen panels, citizen review boards, things of that nature, but give them citizen review boards that have actual teeth. So I don't think that doing something is overly complicated, but I absolutely believe that there are little things that all of us can do, if nothing more than engaging in sometimes difficult conversations, uh, because we all want a fair and transparent world. So it's not enough just to be not negative. You, you also need to be, you need to be positive. You need to be actively engaged but because we all want the same community. So that's what I think about it when I think about a broken system. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy, what about for you? Yeah, I think part of what I thought the series was so powerful, and um, I was a little bit struck in particular by Xavier Miguel Rathbe, just because I happen to know him, because part I know we're going to talk about this later, but a big part of our work on criminal justice has been with the Campaign for Fair Sensing of Youth. And while the system is, you know, maybe irretrievably broken, from what we heard yesterday, just the, the amazing transformation of someone like him, who, you know, at 13 was sentenced to 25 years in prison and has made this beautiful life where he is focusing on change and transformation and grace. And so to me, I love hearing those stories. I think hearing the stories about people who have just been through this um, process and then come out the other side and want to make change and want to create, you know, that spark in all of us to also participate in that change. That's one of the reasons why, you know, we've gotten interested in the issue. More on that with you in a minute, Kathy. Donna, what about for you? Uh, where does it start? How do we how do we help this system? Well, you know, Jeremy, the thing that really struck me, um, both about the session as well as in the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, is how important it is to raise awareness about what's really happening in our criminal justice system. I think so many of us who have not been directly impacted really have no idea that the how the system works or the various areas that really just aren't working, frankly. And so it's really hard to fix something unless you first acknowledge that, you know, parts of the system just aren't working. And overall, it's not producing the results that I think any of us would want, um, which is ultimately to rehabilitate people. Um, most people um, who are incarcerated are going to end up back in society, and we want to make sure we have a fair, just process, but also one that's effective in rehabilitating people, because that's ultimately going to increase public safety. So I think, I mean, first of all, just kudos to the team for elevating the stories, because until we're honest about the problems and own them, just like all the other sort of inequities and disparities in society, we can't have honest conversations and drill down to real solutions to tackle them. Yeah, one of the moments that stuck out for me, and I, I think you all would agree, was Adrian said he feels hopeful but exhausted, Donna. Uh, how can we help? Let's start there. Well, you know, First of all, I think one of the things we've really got to do, and maybe I'm saying this from a public policy um, perspective, because that's what I spend my time doing, um, is really lean into the underlying policies um, that have resulted in this problem. I mean, in the 1980s, you had um, a much smaller fraction of people who were incarcerated, and what changed is not an increase in crime rates, but really a change in underlying laws and public policies. So. One of the things that I think we can do and that we are doing is using our voice and our influence with policymakers to lean in and really call for reform and change in various aspects of the system. Because when you look at the system, it's not one coherent um, system that's working well. It's a, it's a series of very, in many ways, independent systems um, that have you know, various problems. And so one is weighing in and trying to help change the underlying policies. And then two, I think another thing that we can do is really, you know, create proximity and shine a light on these issues, which is back to my earlier point about raising awareness about it, you know, really creating an environment for those of us who have not um, been in close proximity with folks who have been impacted and impacted negatively by this system to give them a platform so that we can actually see their humanity, see them as people and understanding how what, what's their story? How did they get here? Um, and what have they done since they may have made a tragic mistake in their lives? So I think 
creating proximity means hosting convenings, having events where you give them a platform, and but more importantly, you give people who haven't had the exposure, um, you know, have them in the audience to be able to really listen and learn, and I think oftentimes feel inspired to act. So, Kathy, uh, some employee comments after the the first uh, episode of Next 20 asking, why would Verizon get involved in this? Where does it lead to uh, a road in business for us? Uh, And why have we taken a position on on criminal justice reform? Thanks, Jeremy, for that question. Um, A big part of what we do in public policy, a big part of what our organization does is take positions on policy issues that are central to Verizon's core values and that are important to our customers and our employees. So as a a company committed to racial equality and equity, it's important for us to use our voice to speak out and to speak up on these issues. I mean, this issue affects millions of people. As Donna mentioned before, we have 2.2 million people incarcerated in the U.S. right now. We have the highest per capita rate of any country in the world. And it's not just the people who are incarcerated, it's the people that are on parole in their families. So these are millions and millions of people, many of whom are our customers, many of whom are employees. And it's important that we use our voice just to try to bring attention to the issue of need for reform. You heard Hans the other day speak about his role with the Business Roundtable, and that just shows how the business community itself is coming together just to try to bring policymakers' attention to the fact that it's important to be resolved, that these are important issues and important questions that everyone, every citizen in the U.S. needs to pay attention to. And, you know, as Verizon, that's part of what we do. We focus on what's important to our four stakeholders, one of which is society. And so I see our role in speaking out on these issues as a way of facilitating that mission as well. Donna, give me the breakdown. Exactly what is Verizon doing? And What are the areas of work uh, that we're taking part in? So, Jeremy, we have focused on three areas. And let me start by saying we have a lot of humility around this work. We are by no means experts, um, but we've been doing this work for about two years now. And the first area has really been, as I mentioned, focusing on changing policy. So we have spoken out and publicly supported federal and state criminal justice reform laws um, Craig has written prolifically about them. Probably the, the the most prominent was the First Step Act, where we, which is really landmark uh, criminal justice reform federal act. Um, but we've also supported things like uh, allowing Pell grants to uh, go to folks who are incarcerated, um, ensuring that the federal government bans the box, just like Verizon does. So we have been weighing in to really, frankly, send our lobbyists to the Hill and publicly support bills. The second thing we've done is used our legal skills in the pro bono field. So we'll be focused, um, we've expanded our very robust pro bono program to include this area of work. And we've done two things there. One, we've represented folks who were incarcerated as children who are now eligible for early release. And when I say early, it's really after 20 to 25 years under a lot of the state reform laws. But we have partnered with the organization that Xavier represents to do that, the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. And we have two cases currently. And the last area has really been, we've hosted a series of convenings where we've brought together impacted people, criminal justice reform experts, policymakers, uh, our stakeholders, to really elevate and examine the various aspects of the system that need reform. And so we've really increased the exposure. And, and frankly, we've learned a lot. And we think that our community and network, even in the corporate sector, has learned a lot. And a lot of people have gotten engaged as a result of that. Um, and, you know, that's been a really positive aspect of our work that we will continue. And Jeremy, I just also want to mention um, and thank Craig Silliman for his leadership and his um, assistance to us on this work. There are very few senior executives of corporations, honestly, in the country who have used their own personal voice um, to speak out on these issues. And again, like Donna said, with humility, just to bring attention to the problem and to try to bring policymakers together um, to find a solution. And he's been incredibly supportive of me and of Donna and of our whole team. And I want to make sure that um, we give him a big thanks for all his support. 
Mike, prior to your time uh, at Verizon, you you served in the uh, the FBI. Before that, you were a member of the uh, United States Marine Corps. Thank you for your service, as always. Uh, employees have asked about your your point of view uh, on the recent uh, injustices and what we've seen over the the past couple of months. Now, uh, what's your reaction? Well, for the most part, they uh, all of them have sickened me. I mean, the George Floyd homicide was absolutely inexplicable. I'm happy to say that every police officer I've talked to, both active duty and uh, retired, all thought the same thing, that that was absolutely repugnant. Uh, and so I think that everybody also should understand that 98% of police that get up each day get up just like Verizon employees do, to come and do an honest day's work and to not inflict pain or harm or even death on someone. So we're really talking about bad people. I agree the system has to change, training has to change, and, and we have to take ego out of, of the equation, which often gets in the way. So it's also about the right people that we hire. And one of the things I think we can do, I want to encourage more more people of color. I want to include uh, of color, period, uh, to join uh, law enforcement, to become prosecutors, to become uh, public defenders. You might say, why prosecutors? Well, because prosecutors make sure that the system is, is uh, engaged fairly. And so I think we need to be part of the system in order to change the system. So I don't want to see uh, people of color fall away from p careers in the judicial system. I want to see more people come into the judicial system because I think that's where you'll start to see real effective change. After all, when an 18-year-old white male comes before the average judge in this country, that judge sees his son, his grandson, his nephew. When he sees an African American, he sees a predator. He sees something much more, uh, much you'd use much more pejorative adjectives for what he sees standing in front of him. So we can legislate a lot of this, but this is also a war of hearts and minds. And that's what I want to see us win. Does criminal justice reform or defunding the police, do those terms scare you? No, not at all. And and police training changes all the time. It's 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 a constant system of iteration. But reform doesn't scare me at all. It's what we need. When we say defund, we need to describe what that means. If you mean putting a police department out of business, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. If you mean demilitarizing police departments uh, to some extent and defunding that capability, maybe I can, I could be more convinced that defunding has a role, but as a general objective, you know, we need the police departments. We need good policemen, good police women in this country. We need good police officers in this country. We need good judges, good prosecutors, good defense attorneys. So I don't want to defund police when that may preclude them from engaging in training that is critical to tamping down these instances of brutality. Uh, what about the experiences that Adrian uh, and Xavier shared? Uh, do any of those ring true for you or any stories you'd like to share? Those stories do ring true for me. Now, I grew up in Chicago on the south side. Every place Xavier talked about, I'm familiar with. But I feel the need contextually to share a different kind of story so that people understand a little bit of that other world as well. When I was in the FBI, I was doing an undercover case, and the subject, when I first met him as an undercover, he said, I need to tell you something. If I ever found out one of my associates was working with the police, he said, if it was going down, that would be the first person I'd kill. I'd put a bullet right in their head. Zoom up eight weeks. We're doing the final deal that I'm going to do with him before we take him down. He comes up in a car park right next to me. He says, let's do the deal right here. We were supposed to go to another location. I called the team in. He looks up. He sees the team coming in. I'm reaching for my gun at the same time, but my gun had slid to the back of the car. He's, he, he looks at me, looks at the FBI agents coming at him, reaches in between his seat, and I scream at him to freeze. I don't have a gun. I scream at him to freeze, and my partner, she had her gun on him, which made him freeze. When that whole episode was over, I was shaking on the way back to the office. I was literally shaking. You might think because I was afraid. Well, I was afraid, but the reason I was shaking was that if I'd had my gun, would I have shot him? And what's important to note is that he didn't have a gun. He was trying to loosen his brake to get away. 
But I was thinking about what he had told me eight weeks ago, and he's reaching in between his seat. I thought he was reaching for a gun. And to this day, I am grateful to God that I maybe that I didn't have my gun because I might have shot him. I would have had two seconds to decide whether to use deadly force or not. So every time there's a police shooting, I don't want people to think, people who are listening to this, that that cop got up that morning wanting to harm somebody. I never wanted to shoot anybody. And I was really, really glad I didn't have to in that instance. But I often wonder if I'd had my gun, would I have shot him? And he, I would have shot an unarmed man. All he was trying to do was undo his brake. But I couldn't see what his hand was on at that time. And I think that's important for context around this whole issue. These are a lot of people who get up every day trying to do the right thing. I get it that the system's broken. The system needs to be some systemic repairs. But at the same time, you have people just like in our company trying to get up and do the right thing. So, Mike, obviously you had to exercise split second decision there uh, in the case that you were following through an investigation that had been taking months. Let's talk about the situation with Adrian and the video he shared us. How do you react to that and the decisions that were made there? I think that's a com com completely different situation, and it's a story, it's a situation that infuriates me. The reason being, the cop put his gun on a, on a subject, a subject that he thought uh, was dangerous enough to hold his gun on him. Then he sees Adrian engaged in a perfectly legal activity, and he not only holsters his gun, he turns his back on what we're all to presume was a dangerous sub suspect. Then he goes and he braces Adrian and pushes him against the wall simply because he didn't follow his instructions, instructions that he's not legally op that he's not legally obligated to follow. He's on his own porch. He's filming. He's not interrupting the conduct of official police business. So at the end of the day, Adrian was not doing anything illegal. That was not a split second decision. That was a decision based on a cop's ego because he had told somebody to do something and that person didn't immediately respond. And that is wrong. That's the kind of train that that episode should be used as a training film that that is not what police work is about. We really need to emphasize that we we're here to serve and protect. The serve needs to be in bigger letters, in my opinion. What type of training do you think would, would be useful there, Mike? Well, there's a study going on in New Orleans. It's about teaching police how to intervene. One thing you notice about the average brutality situation that we've seen in this country, multiple officers are standing around. And the thing is, how do you get officers to break in and to intervene, not to tell on other cops, but to prevent prosecutions, terminations, liability, and most, most importantly of all, to forget uh, to to eliminate innocent people from being harmed or even killed. All somebody had to say in the George Floyd situation is, get your knee off his neck. We got this. He, he, he's ours. We own him. Stop. So that kind of intervention training, I think, is really, really going to go a long way. And they're doing it in New Orleans, a, a, a city that's had its challenges with its police department. And if it can be effective there, I think it can be effective anywhere. But that's one of many different programs. But this problem is something we can address, and I think we can solve this problem. But it's going to take the efforts of many to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Donna, next question for you. Uh, reflecting mm -hmm. on the uh, stories that Xavier shared, and uh, just remarkable to, to talk about his, his journey. Uh, through your work, what has surprised you most uh, about people who are incar incarcerated? You know, when we first started this work, I had one of the most impactful meetings that I've ever had working um, at Verizon. And it was a meeting with Craig Silliman and, and Kathy Grillo and several members of the campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, which uh, Xavier is a, is a part of. And it was with Xavier and another young man named Eric Alexander, both of whom were uh, sentenced to life without parole or extreme sentences as children. And as I listened to their stories, the, the trauma of their childhoods. I mean, just horrific childhoods. As Xavier shared a little bit of his, but that's not uncommon as we've met more and more folks associated with the campaign. When you think about not only the trauma that they were sort of born into, but also the trauma of growing up and being a kid in prison who, you know, for 20 years, of course, many of these 
folks when we meet them now, they're in their 30s and 40s. But what struck has struck me most about that partner and those individuals is just how extraordinarily talented they are. And to think that, you know, we as a society said, you know, you're worth no more than to you know, spend the rest of your days in prison. I mean, incredible loss of talent. I mean, compassionate, smart, humility, and extreme um, self-reflection and remorse and growth. Um, so as you can imagine, to be able to qualify even to be to um, early release after, and I say early, but it may be after 20 or 25 years under reform laws focused at juveniles, I mean, they, they had to be extraordinary in, individuals to be able to um, get past a judge and a review board to, to have this real second chance at life. And I'm just so you know, pleased to have had this experience to know that, you know, someone who goes in at 13 and, you know, such tremendous talent is now not only free, but a lot of these folks, I mean, almost every one of them are so dedicated to giving back, to making sure that other young people who grew up the way they did don't have that experience and also helping folks once they leave um, prison to really reintegrate into society in, in a productive way. Kathy, going to you on this one, for those of us on the sidelines who might feel hopeless, uh, how can we get in the game? And you mentioned the things that we're involved in. What are some things we can do right now to uh, to be involved for change here? I think there's a few things. First, um, connect. So Donna made the point about proximity and just how, um, how important it is to actually know people who've had this experience, who've been incarcerated, who've come out and tried to make their life better and trying to change. Um, that's really important. And there are ways you can do that. Um, Donna was talking about that meeting that we had with, with Craig and, and the campaign. And there are ways to do that, I think. Um, so connect. Also donate. I mean, there's plenty of ways that you can use your resources in your position to try to help. I know at Next 20, we went through a bunch of organizations where you can, uh, you can use your money. And then just get involved. There are plenty, you know, Mike mentioned local elections, really important. Who are the prosecutors, right? Who are your local officials? I mean, it matters who your, rep who your representatives are at the federal level, but it really matters if you care about these issues, who your rep representatives are at the, at the local level. So all of those ways, um, just be interested, go on the internet or send me an email, send on an email. And uh, we can make sure that we integrate you into what we're doing, you know, Verizon's work, um, or we can just give you some ideas about places uh, where you can learn more. Mike, what about for you? Uh, how can folks get involved? Well, I think we have to hold ourselves accountable. You know, I was in a barbershop once and guys were talking about how unfair black barbershop and guys were talking about un how unfair the judicial system was. And then five minutes later, somebody talked about being called to jury duty. And that same group was talking about all the easy things you can say to the judge or magistrate to get out of jury duty. Well, I, I, I finally slapped the chair and said, are you all even listening to yourself? So we have to hold ourselves accountable. So I think you can vote jury duty town hall meetings. Uh, if you, if you hear that the chief is, is meeting with townspeople, go to that meeting. You have to make people understand what your experiences are. As, as Donna mentioned, you know, we didn't all have the same experiences. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, the same area as Xavier, and my ex experiences with the police is completely different, completely different. All of them were positive, which is why I went into law enforcement. So the black community's experience with law enforcement, I would argue, is not monolithic, but we have to get engaged. We have to have our voice heard. If you have an episode, forget about brutality, but just unprofessional treatment, make sure somebody knows about that. We can't be silent. It, when you're silent, the thing didn't happen. So we have to be we have to be advocates for ourselves and we have to be advocates for our community. And we have to volunteer with youth groups, things like that. I did prison outreach. And the thing that struck me the most is most of the people were in there simply because they didn't have a strong male role model. I grew up in a single parent family, my father. And uh, people talk about peer pressure. I grew up with peer pressure. I didn't want to make my father <laughs> upset. So um, just things like that are ways that we can get engaged and we can touch the youth of youth of today who are going to be these prosecutors, these public defenders, these police officers, these judges of the future. I want them to know they can do that. Mike, thank you so much. Donna, Kathy, same to you. Thanks for uh, talking about this, continuing the next 20 conversation uh, and the things that we can all do to uh, make a change uh, in a positive way.
uh, in the days to come. Appreciate it. Thank you all.